Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining us to help choose home when care is needed, a podcast all about the benefits, value, and safety of receiving care and services in the one place that feels most comfortable wherever it is that the person needing care calls home. I'm your host, Marilee Orsini, and I've been involved in health care at home since 1981. Before we meet today's guest, a brief thank you to our sponsors and partners, the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, Access, and Core Cubed. Today's episode is number nine of season four. Our guest today is Jason Bring, healthcare partner at Arnold Golden Gregory, an Atlanta-based law firm where he co-chairs the firm's national post-acute care team. Jason has a lot of involvement in the industry and he is currently serving on the board of the National Association for Home Care and Hospice. Please help me, won't you, and welcome Jason Bring to help choose home. Jason, first, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest today. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Same here, Marilee. Thanks for having me. Now, you are bringing a different perspective than we've had before. Can you tell me a little bit about not only your law firm, but also your position there and your position in the industry? Sure. I'm a partner with the law firm of Arnold Golden Gregory, and one of our largest practice areas, no surprise, is on healthcare, and especially post-acute care, which for consumers out there is really defined as the care that you receive usually after you leave a hospital. So acute care is what happens in a hospital. Post-acute are the things that happen afterwards, and that usually ranges from nursing home to home health hospice, assisted living, things along those lines. And so when we refer to post-acute, that's what we mean. And our law firm is one of the largest in the country with focus on post-acute care, the long-term care aspects for patients. We represent providers primarily, meaning that we help nursing homes, home health, and hospice providers really navigate the waterfront of regulations and reimbursement in that area. And then me personally, we try to be very active in the industries that we service. And so I'm a member of the board of the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, one of the leading organizations, as the name implies, for home care and hospice services. And then I'm also active with the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization on legislative and and related issues. So we try to have good understanding of the industry, but we're on the provider side primarily. And walk me through how what you do eventually affects the consumer of care at home services. Yeah, that's a great question, Marilee. You know, our providers out there, especially on the legislative front, you know, healthcare is approximately 18% of our GDP. And obviously, with that amount of the national gross product going to healthcare, it comes with a lot of regulation and legislation and oversight. And so, to some extent, I help associations shape legislation that will hopefully better serve consumers in the end through better reimbursement for the provider, through better options to be innovative through measures such as telehealth, for example, which has been on the forefront, especially since COVID, to try to have legislation that would allow the use of telehealth in a home health setting. All of those types of things ultimately impact the consumer and how they receive care at the end of the day. Now, that's not my day-to-day job necessarily, because a lot of my day-to-day is interpreting those regulations that do exist, trying to make sure that our that our clients are being compliant, and if there's an alleged issue, trying to make sure that we resolve that appropriately for them. Jason, so what are the current issues right now that a consumer might be interested in? Yeah, from a legislative perspective, there's a lot going on. Uh, Anytime we have a new administration coming in, and we're still in that phase of the Biden administration coming forward with some new initiatives, as well as some initiatives that were out there and being talked about and proposed before the new administration, one of which is really significant, and that's the Choose Home legislation that we expect to be introduced really any day now, if not this week. 
And the idea behind that is to really to create a new payment model for home health that's built around tying home health and personal care services together. And the idea is to keep patients who might otherwise go into a nursing home to keep them at home and for a reduced cost. And so there's a buzzword in the home health industry and just healthcare in general, this or buzz phrase, I would say, called home and community-based services. And what we found over the years is that patients, especially baby boomer generation, want to be at home. They want to be with their family. And, and the longer that we can keep them at home and in their community-like setting, the overall outcomes tend to be better and the cost goes down. And so this new payment model that's being proposed and has a lot of support would help accommodate that and allow us to keep innovating as we meet the needs and preferences of folks to stay in their homes or stay with their families as they age in place. Jason, do you have any idea why we have not been focusing on home and community-based services in the past the way we are now? I think a variety of reasons. You know, we saw through the 80s, perhaps, and 90s, and continuing on, you know, the building of institutions. And by that, I mean mostly nursing facilities. We had a more mobile population with children moving, you know, from maybe where they grew up to a different location and their parents weren't there in the same community. And I think it driven by patient preferences, technology, reimbursement, all those things coming together, and then just more data that we've developed over the years to show the better outcomes with folks staying in their home or home-like settings, that all those are really coalescing and technology is going to play an important part of that as well. As we've seen through the COVID pandemic, we now have better technology to help meet the needs of patients where they are. And you know, we all know that from whether it's your iPhone or whatever other device you have, you can get a lot more information and connect with people over FaceTime or other venues. And that includes communicating with your healthcare providers. Now, there's traditionally not been that, that opportunity. And in fact, that's another piece of legislation that's pending right now, the HEAT Act, which would allow additional authorization to provide home health services via telehealth in a limited way. There's not, and right now can't be a substitute for that in-person touch that we all need and the home health industry provides so well, but we have to augment that with technology. And that's one additional opportunity that's out there as patients embrace technology, as the government embraces technology for payment streams, and then also to, to help overcome the shortage in the workforce that we have in the healthcare industry, really the country overall, but it's specifically tough in the healthcare industry to fill positions and technology will help augment that. Well, it, it sounds like, I know that COVID pushed a lot of services into the home and also brought a greater awareness of services in the home, but it sounds like legislation is now supporting that movement. That's absolutely right, Mary Lee. The legislation is coming. And then, you know, to kind of keep the theme going on the legislation, as I mentioned, there's just a lot of things out there. But another one is uh, President Biden's, as part of the uh, American Jobs Plan, but it's a little more specific. It's the Better Care, Better Jobs Act. And that is a little more specific to the home and community-based services. And it's proposed to expand Medicaid funding for home and community-based services. It would strengthen access by expanding the financial eligibility criteria. It would also help uh, expand the workforce that I mentioned by helping bring more funding for hourly workers, increasing the payment rates for those workers and then encourage some innovative models. All that is on the Medicaid side, and for those consumers out there, our, our federal program of reimbursement for these services often happens under Medicare, 
which is the federal program. Medicaid, by contrast, is a federal state partnership, and each state has its own Medicaid program. And typically about 50% of the funding comes from the federal government and 50% from the state. But along with that comes a lot of federal re regulation and infrastructure. The Biden Better Care, Better Jobs Act would focus on the Medicaid side of that. But again, just another initiative really, again, uh, showing the importance of home and community-based services to this administration, to Congress, which is also on board with a lot of these, and to the, the providers who are also on board in making sure that patients are getting the care in the environment that's appropriate for their issue, but also important and, and appropriate for their desires. And so making sure people get the preferred care that they want as much as possible. And it sounds like not only the preferred care, but correct me if I am wrong, it seems like since home and community-based services cost less than institutional care, that this should be a positive in terms of expenditures. Absolutely, Marilee. It's, it should absolutely be a net-net win for patients, for the, for the government, and for providers. Of course, providers believe in, and I agree that they should share in the savings that are recognized so that they can continue to strengthen their workforce and continue to deliver, you know, innovative care. But it's it's a win-win lowering the cost overall for the system and improving outcomes and improving savings. So you have just a triple win. And a lot of those ideas, and, and there have been some models on this that have been underway and continue to come underway with some new regulations that just now were proposed to make them more permanent. But that would those models have shown that it keeps patients from going into the hospitals and nursing homes as frequently as if the care was not there. So it reduces the hospitalizations, reduces the nursing home admissions, all of which is good for patients and their families. Now, you are serving on the board of the National Association for Home Care and Hospice. Can you share with me what you feel you're bringing to that board? Sure. I serve, just to clarify, on the on the board of the National Association for Home Care and Hospice. I think that's what you said. And then yes. do, do legislative committee work for NHPCO. But I like to think that I bring a little bit different viewpoint. I think I'm the first lawyer ever to serve on the NAC board. Of course, Bill Dombey, the president of NAC, is an attorney, and we've had the decades of his amazing experience and uh, knowledge. And so definitely don't replace or even replicate him. But I do come at it from what I see with my clients, and that is the provider issues that, that we deal with, the struggles and challenges, oftentimes getting paid. And that's a lot of what I do on a daily basis and make sure that if my clients deliver the care to the consumers out there, the beneficiaries, the patients, that they're getting paid for it appropriately by the government. And it's a two-way street, you know, good care deserves good payment. And sometimes the government tries not to pay providers when they should, and that's where I come in. And a lot of patients and beneficiaries are surprised that the government wouldn't be paying for care that was provided. And sometimes it's as minor as, you know, things, you know, I'm using the euphemism, but dotting the I's and crossing the T's, maybe you left a date off of a document somewhere and the government might try to deny thousands of dollars based upon that. And that's not fair to the providers. It's not fair to the patients that they serve because without appropriate payment, my clients, the providers out there, can't meet their mission of delivering all of this innovative care and delivering all the telehealth and everything else that we talk about. So that's where I feel like I come in and bring those viewpoints to bear. Are you at all involved in any types of value-based purchasing agreements or arrangements? Our firm is, and those come through me from time to time. And the idea there is when we talk about value-based purchasing for our consumers there, 
the government used to be what we call a passive payor of health care. So if you think back a few decades, you, you go in to your doctor's office or wherever the hospital, and they would just essentially take their costs, add a, um, add a profit margin, and then build the government for it. And then the government would pay. And there was a lot of waste in that system. And so over the years, we've transitioned to the government being an active purchaser. And in, in being an active purchaser instead of a passive payor, the government's looking for value. And that's what we talk about when we say value-based purchasing. Just like any of us go out and do, if we're, if we're buying a car, we want to make sure that we're getting the best value for our money. And the government's doing that. And how they do that is to monitor outcomes, monitor savings. And so if you're getting better care at a lower cost, well, then obviously that is value. And so we do have, and we're seeing more and more arrangements and initiatives, demonstration projects to really test some of those models within home health and other post-acute settings. Jason, we seems like just we just started the interview, but we're coming to the end of our time here. So my question to you is, is there something you thought I was going to ask you that I have not asked you that you would like to say? I think that the only when we were talking about other legislative initiatives that consumers need to be aware of, we've heard a lot in recent days and there's ongoing negotiations day by day here as we're down to the wire on the proposed infrastructure bill that, that's being talked about. And there's apparently Republican support in a much pared down version. But for the consumers out there, originally that bill had about $435 billion allocated by the uh, Democrats and the Biden administration for home and community-based services. That is an astronomical figure when you sit back and think about it, but one that's that's needed. And so when the pared down version, those funding right now are not part of that final bill, but I would expect as we see the overall funding for the, the national budget through the reconciliation process as the year proceeds to see a return of those discussions and return of those funding items for home and community-based services, all of which, if passed, would be wonderful for consumers and the industry. And, you know, one begets the other. If it's out there and the providers are putting in place better and newer and more efficient processes and hiring, you know, more folks and paying them more because of the funding, then all that nearest to the benefit of our consumers out there. So that's something to keep a watch on as uh, we move forward the rest of the year. Well, you're certainly bringing a positive outlook to the future from a legislative standpoint. Let's hope that we continue to move in that direction. And I want to thank you so very much for your time today. It's much appreciated, and I'm sure our consumer audience will enjoy understanding what's happening from that bigger macro picture. And thank you. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Marilyn. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening today. And a special thanks to our sponsors and partners, National Association for Home Care and Hospice, Access, and Core Cubed. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to our podcast and take the time to leave a review on Apple Podcast. We are now also on Spotify and most other places where you find podcasts. Like and follow us on social media and join us, won't you, to spread the word and help choose home when care is needed. Music